What's up, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Syracuse Football Post Game, presented by Krause Health, the exclusive health care provider for SU Athletics, Brent Axe, Emily Liker. It is very early in the morning on the East Coast if you are watching us live. But see, the beauty of this, Emily, is it's the Internet. It's everywhere. Who knows where people are experiencing this? If you are watching this somewhere uh, in the future here on Saturday or Sunday at a reasonable hour or listening on podcast, we thank you for that. But for those of you that are hanging live here uh, early Saturday morning, November the 4th, we greatly appreciate your patience. Uh, you know, look, things happen. It was a late post game. Emily and I have some stuff to do to wrap up after the game, but we are glad to be here for the people because you need to vent about this one, I'm sure. Syracuse loses to Boston College 17-10. to They have lost five straight games. They are 4-5 and five on the season. And while a bowl game is still technically a possibility, it is becoming Wilson the volleyball floating further and further away from a Syracuse offense that did not have starting quarterback Garrett Schrader in this game, which we will get into, and an offense that has just looked inept with or without Schrader in the last five games, a defense that's balling out and doing what it can to hand that offense opportunity after opportunity after opportunity, but they were all squandered. And now, not only this game, but... The, the, the thing that's on everybody's mind, of course, is the status of Dino Babers and what this game will do to throw a log on that fire. I certainly know what the fans are saying about this on social media. We're going to play some voicemails coming up. And just a reminder, you can always leave us a voicemail at 315-552-1964. Uh, Emily, before I get your thoughts, and we really dig in on a, a lot of interesting things to talk about here, I mean, I just think we're at the point of no return. When it comes to Dino Babers, I think I don't know how you can sit down and logically tell somebody like he is going to be the coach that's going to lead Syracuse forward into a year nine beyond the contract that is there. There are three games left and you always have to kind of leave a window open that something weird can happen. But this is a fan base that if last week wasn't the last straw, this week could be the last straw. Next week could be the last straw. Like, I just don't know how at this point. Syracuse under Babers is 19 and 44 in ACC play since he took over. That is tied for dead last with Duke. And by the way, if I'm a Duke football fan, I'm feeling a lot better about life these days with what Mike Elko is doing. They're kind of getting away from the doldrums that were there. Not that David Cutcliffe didn't do all he could with Duke football, but obviously things just kind of ended the way that they did. It's Duke, it's Virginia Tech, a program on the rise, an ascendant brand, as an athletic director I know that recently said. Look at Boston College. I mean, it's not pretty. What we saw tonight, Emily, as no. our friend Nate Mink said, was good old Northeastern football, which was appropriate with Paul Pasqualoni in the building tonight, as as we'll note here. Uh, this is just not a sustainable product, and this is just not the coach to lead them forward. And I asked Dino that at the press conference, you know, why should people still believe that you are the guy to do this? And he went back to the same thing he said, you know, seven, eight years ago when he came here, the faith line, right? Belief without evidence. And I'm sorry, I I just think it's over. I think people have, for the most part, just kind of come to the conclusion that this just cannot be sustainable going forward. So whether it's next week, the week after that, after the season, I just don't see how you can if you're John Wildhack, say that he is the right coach for this football program. And this was done under the umbrella of the Board of Trustees being in town this weekend. It was Parents Weekend. You know, Emily, they actually had 42,523 people in the building legitimately, by yeah, the way. Yeah, it was full. It filled in. Mm-hmm. Now, they, they mass as exodus uh, out of there. Yeah, Emily, it's, it's the fourth quarter. It's 10-10, no matter how ugly the game is and the, the circumstances of what we watched. It's still a game, right? Mm -hmm. And fans were so fed up with what they saw. And it was a weird crowd because you got parents there, parents weekend, what diehard fans are even there. Like it's it's kind of a a unique once a year type of crowd. But they're Mm -hmm. flowing out of there even before Carlos Del Rio Wilson, who started this game through his fourth interception of the day. So I'm just going to start there broadly. But Emily, I'm going to turn to you because, man, it's always something. What a turn of events we saw before the game. Take me through just reporting out, hearing about, and ultimately writing about 
Garrett Schrader out, Carlos Del Rio Wilson in. What happened there? Yeah, well, obviously, I mean, we all watched the Virginia Tech game. Garrett played that entire game. So where he suffered the injury that they say he suffered um, or that a spokesman says he suffered, I will say that I don't believe, and I need to listen to Dino back again, but I don't believe Dino said it was an injury. Like, I don't believe there was a direct answer about like it being an, an injury or not. And that's not me insinuating it's something else. It's just me saying like, trying to be as clear as possible about mm -hmm. where this information is coming from. So we, we obviously all saw him finish that game. He came out and spoke with us on Tuesday, spoke with media like normal. Nothing seemed off about it. Uh, Dino spoke highly of him all week, stuck up for him and was like, this is not a, a Schrader issue. Like he has guys around him that need to step up. We as coaches need to do better. Um, you and I, no one at Syracuse.com had heard anything to indicate Nothing. that he, not he was thing. not going to be available until I'm sitting in the stands. I've just arrived at the dome. I went down and kind of, I like to get close and watch a little of pregame from down in the stands before everyone gets there. And I get tweet replies that start popping up about when I'm tweeting about people being unavailable, being like, oh, have you seen Garrett? Is Garrett available? I heard Garrett was unavailable. And I was like, oh boy. Um, so yeah, I mean, eventually we saw he came out in sweats. I was told by the team spokesman that it was an injury he suffered at Virginia Tech. He wasn't willing to go in deeper than that pregame um and then post game um i know some people watch post game because i was getting some tweets about it post game i i asked dino i was like when did you know he said he didn't know until thursday which is a pretty similar situation to what happened last year when carlos del rio wilson was forced into the pit game as the starter when garrett was injured didn't know until like 24 hours before um but Garrett hadn't been practicing all week, which is definitely interesting because usually they do not let us talk to guys who are not practicing. Um, and I tried to press him on whether he felt that Carlos was prepared and he decided he did not want to answer my questions anymore. Yeah. And good job by you, on. by the way, asking <laughs> so. those questions that needed to be asked. And look, coaches love to play this cloak and dagger game. Dino loves to play the cloak mm -hmm. and dagger game. Dino will say often, I don't want to give that information to my opponent. So I get it. But let's just backtrack a little bit here. So you have Can Garrett Trader. Oh, go ahead. Yeah. Can I, I was going to say, I want to butt in on the injury thing for a second because I do like pretty much routinely at this point with how often the injuries happen, see people asking like, why is Syracuse so like guarded about this? Like, is this a HIPAA thing? Is it something to do with players' privacy? Like, are other schools like this? I don't know how, like, Syracuse being a private institution, if that factors into it at all. My understanding is that the policy that Syracuse has about injuries and injury disclosures is a Dino Babers policy. Yes. Because plenty of other schools disclose when players are going to be available. There are, there's at least one conference it's one of the bigs. I can't remember if it's the Big Ten or Big 12. Requires teams to put out injury reports a couple days before the game. And those don't necessarily say like, oh, so-and-so has a torn hamstring. But they will say, yeah, it's just like an NFL injury report, right? It's like doubtful out, um, whatever it may be. Uh, we got that at Missouri when I was covering Mizzou in college. Um, so this is, this is a Dino policy. And I think something that, that I'm going to share as well is that it creates Dino's policy about Dino's usual response when we ask about injuries is, oh, well, that's personal. That's their business. It's to the family. It's to the whatever. But that creates an interesting conundrum because then if you go and ask parents or you try to ask the kid about it during the week, like with the, on the chance that SU makes them available even when they're injured, they are often like, well, I don't want to talk about it because the team doesn't like doesn't want me to talk about it. So it's just these two sides kind of like ping-ponging back at yeah. each other, the responsibility or like – the the willingness to like talk about it and it's okay like i don't like if a player really doesn't want to talk about his injury that's fine like i don't think it's super pressing like for someone to go in depth about what they're dealing with i understand there's a lot of stuff that goes through that but like <sighs> more transparency on whether your starting quarterback is going to be available would be really great i think <laughs> Well, and let's backtrack here. So the Clemson game, Schrader takes that shot to the helmet early. Clearly was not the same after that, not only in that game, but in the games that came after that. Before the Florida State game, he has food poisoning, as it's reported by Syracuse. And 
obviously didn't play well in that game. So the the note we got from Syracuse is that he was hurt in the Virginia Tech game. He played in that game right until the, the end. From my knowledge, Emily, you were there in Blacksburg, and we were talking about this at the Dome. I don't think he went in the tent at any point. Was evaluated for some sort of injury they would take on of that game. So I'm not a doctor. I just play one on a podcast here. But what injury could you suffer against Virginia Tech? Play that game, but not play this game, right? Not practice yeah. through the week. It's, I mean, it's possible, I guess, if they were being ultra cautious about something they discovered after that game. But you said it. Garrett came out on Tuesday, and I guess it's on us not to ask Garrett, are you playing in this football game? Like the most basic question there is. But well, he usually I mean, doesn't answer about his health. Which so. <laughs> again, they wouldn't answer anyway. Thank you. So this whole cloak and dagger game, give me a break. And this whole thing that Dino didn't know until Thursday. Look, I'm sorry. I'm going Ron Burgundy meme on you. I don't believe you. I don't believe you. I'm sorry. How do you not know that? If he didn't practice all week, like this isn't adding up. This whole, and Emily, it's you've lost five in a row. Earth to Dino, this whole uh, mystery game you're playing does not work. And uh, look, you brought it up. Other leagues, you have to disclose a little bit. The ACC used to have that policy, the NFL policy, mm-hmm. probable, uh, you know, and, and, and down the list. So that happened, right? Clearly, Carlos Del Rio Wilson was in over his head a little bit and mm-hmm. was not ready to take the reins. And Emily, we're not just talking about this game and what we saw from Carlos Del Rio Wilson, which, you know, the numbers are not pretty for him passing seven of 17 for 37 yards. He did show some flashes that he could run the football, 12 carries for 67. The pace of the offense actually picked up at times, believe it or not, but he threw four picks in this game. The last of which he was hurt on hobbling on the last possession of the game. Dino said he was good to go. But, Emily, this is not just about this game. Carlos Del Rio Wilson, at this point, you cannot anoint the quarterback of the future for Syracuse football. I think I've seen enough, not only in this game, but in the flashes of other places, that they would have to bring some competition in the room to try and beat him out. If that's on the roster currently with Braden Davis, the third-string quarterback they brought in via transfer, or somebody else, because I don't think Carlos really grabbed it by the reins in this game tonight. Yeah, well, and it'll be interesting because we don't know. Like, we don't know, and Dino said he doesn't know if Garrett will be available again this season. We are potentially looking at three more games where a backup quarterback has to play. Um, and I think th- this kind of ties back. We, we, I mentioned transparency. I think I think I mentioned transparency in my talk about the injuries and stuff. And I think this just extends beyond injuries as well into like a kind of like I I, I don't think there is anything to lose at this point from being transparent about everything. And I know there's, oh, well, we don't want to give away our game plan. We don't want to give away who's playing, yada, yada, yada. Other teams are going to figure it out. Like now that Carlos has played one, every other team is going to study both game game plans. So like, I think it is in Syracuse's best interest. And honestly, in Dino's best interest, if he wants to keep his job, to be transparent because you are not going to, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this correctly. It's like, if you, you are not going to lose any more people like trust and faith Mm -hmm. being transparent than you would by not being transparent. If you're transparent, you might actually retain more people being like faithful in you because you're being honest with them. And honestly, it's something he talks about with, with the Ohana, with the La Familia and how about I don't, don't BS any... your, your fan base? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, it's all about transparency. And unfortunately I don't think there will be very much of it, but I think that would be the smart move for Syracuse over the next four weeks when That's... it comes to Schrader, when it Emily, comes to everything. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for adding that perspective because you have brought a perspective fresh on that, but that's something that I have felt and known for years and why I don't, it bewilders me why Syracuse doesn't get it, that this doesn't work, and you have a fan base in a blue-collar town, and I get Syracuse fans are from all over the place, as this post-game show proves, people watching all over the place. But a fan base, whether you're in Syracuse, New York, or wherever you are, and, and just don't 
BS us, okay? We get there's certain things football coaches don't want to reveal, but again, it's not exactly working. If anything, Dino should try the opposite. He should go over to Jeff Halfley or Pat Narduzzi next week and say, here's our game plan, and maybe that'll work. So I, I don't get any of that. So we mentioned Carlos Del Rio Wilson. There was another odd suspension in this game, Emily, and Chris Carlson wrote a story about this that you guys can read on Syracuse.com. Elijah Clark. A half suspension. So, exactly. A half suspension. You can't be half pregnant, but you can't have a half suspension, apparently. <laughs> because he, so the way it was described is he violated team rules. And that, the punishment for that was you can only play on special teams. What? What, was, is, what does that mean? What it was is that? So That's, I've never heard of that. Never heard was, of something like that. It was so funny in game. I think it was like the second or third series. Chris and I were sitting next to each other in the press box and we kind of leaned to each other and we're like, wait, where's where's Elijah Clark? Like, why is Cinco not playing? And then we're looking on the sideline and for like a solid like three minutes, I could not fi- pick him out of the crowd down there. There's so many extra bodies at home games. And I was like, oh my God, is he even here? Is he even here? And then we finally saw him. And we're like, huh, that's weird. Like, he looks fine. He's suited up. He's standing right next to coach. Why is he not playing? And then, (laughs) and then he goes in on punt coverage and we're like, oh, that's weird. I was like, hmm, maybe he just had something up that we missed, like on the first drive. And then lo and behold, all he played for the rest of the night was like punt coverage. And we were like, what is going on? And yeah, half suspension. Um, It's worth noting that uh, Mike McAllister had been live tweeting the press conference and tweeted out something about that. And Cinco quote tweeted it with two thumbs down emojis. So that doesn't seem great. <laughs> I don't know if that's a disagreement or and that's like, th- this is just all the odd stuff that's coming out in addition to what we're seeing on the field. And Anthony asked me this question it was the last time a Syracuse quarterback finished the season. I can answer that for you. It was Ryan Nassib in 2012. That's the last Syracuse quarterback that went wire to wire and did not come out of a game due to injury. Or I think he missed like a few series that year when, you know, uh, the backup comes in when it's garbage time, right? That's the last time that has happened. So Emily, just have a lot of odd things happening around this team, let alone what we're seeing on the field. I don't want to go too far down the road and we're 17 minutes in here. Dwight Franey was in the building tonight. Syracuse announced he's going to have his number 54 jersey honored next year he was honored at halftime of this game because he's going into the college football hall of fame and that defense balled out tonight that defense gave the offense so many opportunities now the defense has got to catch more interceptions that come their way that was in somewhat of an issue tonight I mean, at least they're defending yeah. passes comedy of you've errors. got you've got to come up with more of those turnovers but i guess what does it matter if your offense is going to go out there and just fall on its face as mm-hmm. it did all night. But that defense could not have handed that offense more opportunities. And it's weird, Emily, because the, the faults we're talking about with Syracuse, BC is actually thriving on that. Like they're mm-hmm. playing ugly. They're grinding it out. I mean, Castellanos, <laughs> he looks like Doug Flutie out there. I just got to say it. You know, this guy's <laughs> barely five, nine. You can give me a Russell Wilson comparison, whoever you want. Right. <laughs> He's got a gun. He can move. He's elusive. He's he's a water bug out there. He's hard to tackle, and he's making things happen enough. And he, the combination of the run and the and the, and the pass yards, I can give you the numbers here in a second. It's not pretty, but you know what? They're six and three. They're going to a bowl game. It, Jeff Halfley. It seemed like he was going to be on some thin ice, but he found his way. All right. I wouldn't want to root for that and watch that, but if I'm a BC fan and I haven't been to a bowl game. And I believe this is four years and counting, which they, you know, will now go to one because they clinched uh, bowl six eligibility wins. tonight. Mm-hmm. Six wins with the Wasabi Fenway Bowl in attendance. By the way, I think they'd like to have BC in, in that bowl game. I don't want that, but it works for them, right? So Syracuse actually got into a street fight with this team. All you needed was, and Emily, I'm having deja vu because man, we talked about this last week. Just a functioning, competent, intermediate passing game that can make some plays, and you might ugly this one out 20-17 to or something of that nature, but they couldn't even pull that off. 
Yeah, I don't know. I like again, like you. I mean, you just said it. Like we're saying the same things over and over again. So I do want to take it like back to a little like bigger picture again. And for anyone who wasn't in the dome, tell you a little bit more about what that was like tonight. Um, as we already mentioned, I mean the the crowd cleared out early when the game was, I guess technically still a game though. Watching that third quarter and early fourth quarter, I I mean I tweeted like what am I even watching? Is this football? Like <laughs> So long. I, I tweeted comedy of errors, which is a Shakespeare reference. Like I get it. I would, I would have wanted to leave too, if I was able to. Um, but I think there, there's two things that really stuck out to me that happened during this game. And one was during the, I think this was in the third quarter, a drive where Syracuse starts off with two, starts off or like early in the drive gets two false start penalties back to back. And uh, we all know that's not uncommon for Syracuse. That happens a lot. Dino post game seemed to assert that BC was um, mimicking the snap count, which is a penalty. And so I'm curious Mm -hmm. to go back and look at like, we can't hear that stuff from the press box when there's a crowd cheering. Um, So I'm curious to go back and look and see because that's actually been a penalty that's been called a lot more this season and obviously was not called tonight if that was happening. Syracuse gets two false starts and I get about four texts right away being like, oh my God, there are fire Dino Babers chants happening, fire Dino chants loud and clear on the ESPN2 broadcast. Like, and, and from like random people too, like people that I would not expect to text me out of the blue about that are like, can you hear it? And like, we can hear this clear as day through the broadcast. Mm-hmm. We couldn't, so I'm not no. super sure about where it was coming from. Someone said the student section, maybe, I don't know. I did hear a couple ring out at other points during the game. Uh, I mean, they happen for sure, yeah. yeah we just couldn't hear happen. them from our we just, couldn't, yeah. we just couldn't hear it live. There was booing, though at times it was difficult to tell if the booing was directed at Syracuse or at the refs <laughs> um, because – there there were some ref issues tonight there were um but then i think the craziest thing and maybe the most damning thing and obviously i don't know how drunk this person was as they were leaving the dome but there was a fan who like full full on was yelling in the direction of wild hacks box which is right next to the press box and both of them are open air so you can hear everything he was Um, red we he could lean red. down and touch. He was, he was so very angry. angry. Yeah. I wish I had like been quick enough to flick on my recorder and like record, but it was it was exactly what you would think it was. It was Wild Hack, you're a coward, like get rid of Dino. We're not gonna stick around for this. I'm it's sick of this. Acceptable. Yeah. I'm sick yeah. of this. Now, Wild Hack was not in his box at that moment to hear any of that. I think there were a couple people in there. I don't know what their relationship is to Wild Hack or the school. Um, but that's outward like it's one thing for everyone to say what they want to say online and we got a lot of online vitriol about dino and this program again um on twitter slash x but (laughs) to hear someone Uh actively yelling in the dome and like there were some people that seemed a little off put by it but i i honestly like i don't think many people batted an eye about it (laughs) and like i didn't bat an eye about it besides the fact that it kind of it startled me out of my like writing days. Um, yeah, that was that telling. happened. <laughs> that happened for sure. Uh, I want to throw this at you, Emily. So this is the kind of game it was where the defense just did everything possible it could, and the offense could not capitalize on it. Boston College ran ninety-four plays for three hundred and fifty yards. Syracuse ran forty-seven plays for two hundred and forty-six yards. BC averaged 3.7 yards per play. Syracuse averaged 5.2 yards per play. Time of possession favored BC 42 minutes and 16 seconds to 17 minutes and 44 seconds. I hadn't seen that stat earlier when I was looking. I found the Syracuse defense, and I have to say this. I talked to Caleb Okachuku after the game, and I was the only one who talked to him. Mm -hmm. And God bless this kid because he was about as positive as you can be in that situation and i think he was it's like when you're a parent and you can't let your kid see you stressed out i think caleb sees himself as a leader and he's just not gonna break he's not gonna you know he had 
he mentioned that he started again. He did this last year, and he did it again this game. If you notice before the game, if you were at the Dome, he brought the most of the team, pretty much everybody that was active in this game, and they went in the end zone. And he said it was just to say a prayer and to kind of center themselves before the game. And he just keeps saying, I got a lead. We could still make a bowl game. Like, they're, they're trying to cling on to everything they can. So, hey, listen, good for him. This La Familia, the Johanna, if the players are sticking together, it's a tough thing. They're in a situation I can't even imagine right now. But if you're going to look at it from that standpoint, it's important to hear what they're saying and what they're thinking. But everything outside of that is just it's just breaking apart at this point. And what this team can do in the next three games to – I don't think they can – I mean, technically they could save – Dino's job because that's a wild hack decision and if they decide that let's say they scratch out two more wins and a bowl game's the standard then if you're basically admitting that that's all you need that's all you want and that's what the standard of the program is I mean 82 teams go to a bowl game so I guess congratulations that you weren't one of the 40 whatever the math is on that that don't go you're basically admitting you're just treading water and I just don't think, <clears throat> pardon me, that's the message you can be sending right now. And Emily, it's funny because Paul Pasqualoni was in the building tonight and he got a nice ovation from the crowd. He deserves it as much as at the end. And I admit I was one of the people at the end that was calling for a change. The end of the Pasqualoni era, the issue that people had was, and he ran an option focused offense was that it felt archaic, it felt old, it felt like the the dynamics on the offense were running thin. It was just not a team that was fun to watch anymore. So here we are in 2023, and this orange is the new fast thing. You know, I wrote it in my quick takes column after the game. All four tires are flat, and the car's on cinder blocks in the front yard. I just brought it up a moment ago. You can't even run a basic intermediate passing game. And Emily, tonight... One thing we haven't mentioned yet, and Dino said it was because he wanted Carlos Del Rio Wilson to interact with Jason Beck on the field. Beck was on the field for the first time this season calling plays, mm -hmm. and it didn't make a difference, obviously. And I got to start to look at is Jason Beck, like he's the one calling plays. You can tell. I mean, Dino's got a headset and can certainly interject and give his opinion here. And maybe it's what Beck is working with here, to be fair, an offensive line that no matter what will get four or five procedure penalties a game, it seems. You're dealing with a backup quarterback. You're dealing with a lot of issues. But receivers you look, who can't catch. Yeah, receivers <laughs> that can't catch. A, you know, it just there's a, there's a lot of things that are ailing this offense right now. But I got to start to look at Jason Beck and say, man, even as a first-time offensive coordinator, what are you doing to try and get this team out of its funk? We're heading into, ten, into game 10 here, and it's getting worse. So I don't know what to think about what he can do to fix it. I just know I'm not seeing the results on the field. Right, and and I'll kind of I'll kind of talk to you for a minute. Maybe you can queue up some voicemails. I know we have, um, but I, I think it's it's. I tweeted this out when this happened, but BC went for a. Um, fake punt on a fourth down and like that and they got it and that's the type of play that Syracuse fans have been wanting to see for weeks now like even and like granted this game was a little different because it was close but even when it's not close like that's the type of play that shows competitive edge and like a desire to get something done and even if it doesn't work at least you tried and like you're already like in some of the other games you're already down by so much that it doesn't matter really if you give them good field position because you're not going to win it anyway. Um, and I, I, I think just, just going broadly again, like I, I cannot reiterate enough that this was a schedule that had nine winnable games on it. And now we are down to a max seven possible wins for Syracuse. Uh, four of which came in non-conference play. Syracuse is the only team without an ACC win this season. It cannot finish. It will finish below 0.500 in ACC play now that it's lost this game to BC. And you know what? Like, even last week, I had been like, oh, 
well, I still think all four games remaining are winnable. I don't know that they are. I don't know that they are. I'm not even, picking. I'm not picking them to win the rest of the year. How can you? Even Pittsburgh and Pittsburgh is a dumpster fire, but things always seem to go bad against Pittsburgh. They certainly did last year, and I've heard they have in the past. You're dealing with a semi new environment going back down to Yankee Stadium. Um, it, like that just is like ripe for disaster that game. And then you go to for, go to Georgia Tech, which is a team that's been really up and down all season um and I, I i think is kind of the epitome of playing to the level of your opponent so i guess it kind of depends what level syracuse brings and then you have wake forest at home which is probably at this point i feel like maybe the most winnable of the three but if you've lost two more straight like there is no drive to win that game so i don't know it, it, like this was a season where they could have really done something and they haven't well, you got to think about it's possible we saw Garrett Schrader play his last. So his last home game would have been Clemson. Yeah. He didn't play in this one. It's possible. I don't think so. I'm not going to put money. Uh, like, even if they make a change with Dino, I think he'll ride out the season. I don't think Wild Hack will put Rocky Long or somebody in there for the last two games or something. But I, you got to keep everything on the table. But that Wake Forest game you brought up, that could be his last home game. And that's Thanksgiving weekend and the students are out of town and if this keeps sliding down the hill, I can't even imagine what the atmosphere of that game is going to be. So there's just a lot of things that are going to come into focus here over the next three weeks. But Emily, you said it, man. Virginia Tech. Hey, great job, Brent Pry, and what you're doing there. But you got to beat that team. In theory, right? They're on your level. They're your peers. What did John Wildhack say this past week? Now he was talking about NIL when you and Chris talked to him earlier this week, right? Yeah. These are your peers. Well, your peers are beating you, and I'm going to reiterate a stat I brought up at the beginning of the broadcast because you were going through how they can't finish above 500 in the ACC at this point. They're 19 and 44 in ACC play under Dino Babers. That is the worst stretch in the ACC in that time frame since 2016, tied with Duke. And if I'm a Duke fan at this moment, I'm feeling a lot better about my program than Syracuse. Okay, that's what we think, Emily. I'm going to go to the voicemail line, 315-552-1964. Guys, you are awesome. I love that you're leaving us voicemails. I could probably do an entire separate podcast with just your voicemails, but it is currently 1.55 a.m. as we speak, and I'm not going to do that. So I have to save, some of, the, I got, I got to save some of the voicemails we got for another time. So I apologize I couldn't get to everybody, but we do have some here lined up. Let's get them going. And uh, we start Hey, Brent. in San Diego. Your old buddy, San Diego Cuse, uh, JR, out here in San Diego. Um, just a disappointing effort tonight by the team. The defense played great. LaQuint Allen, he battled as, as hard as he could. But just time and time again, Dino not having the, the correct players to be available and Carlos Del Rio Wilson had an entire week of practice, and, and that's what came out to happen. It's just embarrassing. And he, he just lost me after the Virginia Tech game. I've been a big Dino supporter for a long time. It's just we're at, at a point in time in, in the in the program where you have to have a change at this point. It's just not working. Um, really appreciate all the work that you and Emily do. I've been loving the, the podcast and the post-game shows, and hope you guys have a great night. Thank you so much. From San Diego, you stay classy out there, my friend. We go from the West Coast to a frustrated alum a little closer to home. Hey, this is Rob, a uh, Syracuse grad. I have a daughter who's a senior, a son who's a freshman. Just uh, got back from the game and to my hotel room for parents weekend. And, uh, you know, it's disheartening of, you know, a good favors benefit of the doubt and uh, you know he if if it's true he's gonna send it down he needs to win out and win the bowl game otherwise I don't see it. You know, I wish something happened, Schrader was out. You know, I don't know if anyone saw that coming, but I know he wasn't the same since the Clemson hit. And I mean just basically Delio Wilson just he could not, you know, he could not make this pass. You know, with more interceptions than completions almost. And, you know, that's 
the blame is not just on them, it's on the receivers too. So I, you know, I'm just, I'm stunned on the fan for life. Always will be, but you know, I'd love to see change and, you know, but for the better, however that happens. Right. Emily, it kind of reminds me of, I've said this before, i got to come back to this line, because a lot of these fans you're going to hear are like, I'm a fan, I love Syracuse football, but if you think the way things are going is the way we could do this, you are not serious people, right? <laughs> Logan Roy from Succession. Like, I love you, but you are not serious people right now with how this is yeah. going, unfortunately, right? No. Now to Matt in Rochester checking in. Hey, Brent. My name's Matt. I'm in Rochester, formerly from Syracuse. Just calling regarding the uh, loss to BC. I think the issue I kind of have is regarding Dino Babers and how long he's been with Syracuse versus some of his contemporaries. Um, first two guys I think of are uh, Brent Pry, who, uh, if I believe correctly, was with Virginia Tech uh, probably about like two years at this point. And then Tonight with the loss to uh, Jeff Halfley, who has been with Boston College since I believe like 2020. Just trying to figure out why is he being out recruited by coaches? Is he being out coached by other coaches? Not quite sure what to make of it. And I was wondering if uh, you could comment on that. Thanks again. What I would say there, Matt and Emily, I know you want to jump in, is I asked Dino about this at the press conference, and I don't want to misquote him. But I asked him flat out, like, you have the worst record in the ACC since you took over here. And he kind of cited what Matt was saying there, mm -hmm. right? So I would, Matt, I encourage you to go watch the Dino Presser on YouTube and you can see at least what Dino said about that. Yeah, and I, I think, like, it, it is worth noting, I think, that Dino's best season came in his first couple seasons, just like those guys. Um, so, like, Yes, Pry and Halfley are having really great seasons early in their tenure. We will see what happens for them later on. Um, I don't know if that's like I, I would I would judge more like against like we've mentioned like Dave Cutcliffe, like someone who was in the ACC at the same time and has since been let go because of poor performance. Um, yeah, than than necessarily. Those well, two, these are but, his guys. That's the thing you yeah. brought up. Pry, Halfley. Halfley's got mostly his guys in now. Narduzzi is another example. Judge him. I'll go back to the line. Judge you against your peers, right? Mm -hmm. this, these are Dino's players. It is his team. His best teams, for the most part, were with somebody else's players, right? So we have made the full judgment here. There's, there's nothing left to wait for at this point. We go next to Jason from Maryland. What's up, Brent, Emily? This is Jason from Maryland. I just got done listening to Dino Babers presser after the embarrassing offensive performance against Boston College and the loss, 17-10. Um, I'm done. Uh, those answers were atrocious. I was really impressed with the with the media, the way they pressed Dino. Um, you've got a guy in Del Rio Wilson who practiced all week, took reps with the number one uh offense or the number one you know level offense and and that's what he puts out there like he took and he's been there for a couple of years and he looked like he didn't practice and he hadn't played it all year and he just looked terrible um and he looked hurt on top of everything else so he couldn't throw and he couldn't run it looked like his, he hurt his shoulder or something they didn't take him out of the game uh, they were going to bring in McPhail, and they didn't bring him in. Th th then I move on to the other comment when somebody asked him about the discipline. He's like, are you questioning the discipline of my team? Uh, yeah, you've been ranked under 100 or over whatever, b between 100 and 130 in the last four years or whatever it is. The discipline's awful. So many penalties at home. You know, when he was talking, making excuses, there were, they were simulating a snap cow, blah, 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 blah. It's all excuses. It's garbage. The coaching is terrible. Playing for a 56 yard field goal, terrible. Um, it was just the, th this was it for me. This is, this is the end. Um, they need to get rid of him. I don't care if it's now or the end of the year, but th this has to, this has to be the end. Or Wild Hat can go too. I don't really care. Um, if he doesn't want to make a move and he wants to give him another year, I'm not sitting through year nine of this. So, 
Uh, that's all I got, guys. I appreciate all your hard work. Emily especially was great tonight. And, uh, you know, Brent, I always appreciate you and the work that you do. So keep up the good work. Uh, hey, it's basketball season. <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, have a good night. There it is. Yeah, Monday night, Syracuse, New Hampshire, for real at the Dome. They were, they were putting in the the flooring. It was the first time yeah. this season I've got to see them put in the flooring. It was not symbolic. It was literal. Like, get the yeah. football thing out of here and put the court <laughs> out there uh yeah, yeah quickly because we got two more voicemails to get to emily um i had to sustain everything in me not to burst out laughing i'm sorry when dino's like are you questioning my discipline he acted yes. so incredulous yes. about it, and i was like i was like you just had how many penalties and also you just told us someone on the team was suspended yes like <laughs> exactly not, that is you a were the fair most, question to ask. That was a totally fair question, number one. Number two, you were the most penalized team in the country last year, and you're not pacing much above that now. Like They're You're right. not the most penalized team anymore, so congrats on that. But you're still, last I checked, hovering around, as Jason noted, their 100th in the country in that department in year eight. So, yes, I am questioning your discipline, and I'll do it again next week. Two yeah, more looks, voicemails. Looks like here. I'm sorry, go ahead. Looks like they're at number 122. I don't know if that uh, – I didn't look close enough to know if it, that's updated from this game or still from last game. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. right. It's low like, enough. It's not going to get yeah. any better if it's not yeah. updated. All right. Two more here, Emily. Michael Antonio now. This is Michael Antonio. Turn off the lights. The party is over. It's time for Syracuse to actually spend some money and get a championship-level coach. That's the only way to do this. They spent all that money on renovations in the Dome. For what? For just the basketball program? No. You need the football program to keep this train a-rolling. There you go. Football's got to lead the way as much as you've had success in other sports. We brought up its basketball season and all the anticipation and the enthusiasm around Adrian Autry taking over. Football is the sport on the front porch yeah, at any major big time university. And th this front porch, I brought it up earlier. It's got cinder blocks on it. It's still got the Christmas lights up from last year and like an old dirty couch that no one wants to look at. That That's what, that's how you're representing this thing at this point. Yeah, unfortunately, lacrosse doesn't pay the bills or men's soccer, even though sure you can hang your hat on those things, but they don't, they it don't doesn't. pay the bills. They don't pay the bills. And Emily, last but certainly not least, ladies and our gentlemen. Our favorite. Our favorite. The one and only. Rock and Ron. Hey, Brett. Rock and Ron down in Florida, man. Ah, turn out the light. The party's over. <laughs> Two and a How can a coach put out a quarterback that cannot throw a pass beyond his no, excuse me. However, he must have known that Schrader was not going to start this week, way back four or five days ago. He should have made up plays that he could at least move the ball some. We should have had four more touchdowns in there. I feel bad for the defense. They, I think they played a very admirable game. But I think the Turn out the lot. The party's over, my friend. Explain to me any more if you can what's going on. Have a good one. Bye. This is showing my age, but what is that a reference? It was really funny, but what is that a reference to? Turn out the lights. The party's over. Um, because it's two o'clock in the morning as we speak. <laughs> I, I, I know it's right on the tip of my tongue. I just can't think of it at, at the moment. I will okay. text you when I do think of it i didn't even plan that by the way i that wish was i was great. that creative that we had those guys back to back i just stacked up the voicemails i knew i was going to play and to have those two and by the way two very different tones michael antonio <laughs> turn out the lights the party's over then we got rock and run right <laughs> who you gotta love rock and run he's just even when he's complaining about football, like he's in a good mood doing it. Yeah. My he man. just brought my energy up so much at 2 a.m. Yeah. When I need to go to bed. <laughs> I need it because I'm not done. I got another story to write before I go to bed. So thank you, Rock and Ron, for that. Okay, Emily, uh, we've got Syracuse and Pitt next week. It's a 3.30 kickoff. It's at Yankee Stadium. 
because her made a hell of a deal, remember? And they're moving this game to Yankee Stadium. You got a Syracuse team that's lost five in a row. Pitt, who knows what they're going to do against Florida State on Saturday, although that's not looking good. So that's when we'll meet again, both here live on post game, And thanks to those of you that subscribe on podcast and to the Syracuse Sports Podcast as well. Whew. We got three more of these to go. And it's it's all sliding the wrong way at this point. But we will be here to document it all. That's when it feels like work, when you're punching the clock and covering a team that's struggling like this. But yes. we'll be here. We thank you for being here. Emily, I thank you for your hard work tonight and everything that you reported on. And another uh, weird night at the Dome. And our friend Chris Carlson and his great work. And we thank our friends at Krause Health for sponsoring this Syracuse football postgame podcast. Syracuse uh, Krause Health is the exclusive healthcare provider for SU Athletics. I think we'll wrap it up there, friends. Thanks for hanging with us, especially those of you that stayed up very late or early in the morning, however you want to look at it, to check out Syracuse football postgame. And we will talk to you next time.